Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, so I, I, as you've um, been meditating for a while already, I'll begin this session with um, a, a talk. I'm just thinking what I shall talk about. I think I shall carry on a theme that I began in my uh, discourse this morning, and it's the whole area of um, negativity. Um, you may be familiar with the list of three main groups of defilement, mental defilement in Buddhist teachings, Buddhist psychology of alopa, dosa, and moha. And dosa is um, variously translated as hatred, anger, and so on. It's in this particular context, it's, uh, it's an umbrella term for every um, shade of negativity. So from the extreme violent uh, anger and hatred um, all the way up to the slightest little blip in the mind in meditation, um, slightest movement away from um, some sense impression. So what unites all these phenomena is... Um, rejection of a um, unwillingness to be with um, the present phenomena, a wish for it to be something else. Um, in daily life, it could be um, simply, I don't need this, um, or it could be the general um, sense of irritation and frustration with the vicissitudes of daily life and the um, things going on around us. When that negativity um, is expressed in certain personality types, it's more likely to uh, turn into depression. Now, some people meet um, difficult, unpleasant situations. They become very hard and um, aggressive or develop, try to develop some kind of armor plating, other people uh, fold in upon themselves and become uh, depressed. So this is the whole area of human life that I'd like to discuss this afternoon. The fundamental teaching of the Buddha um, the great, the Buddha compared it to the elephant's footprint, um, just as all the, the footprints of all the animals in the jungle will fit within the elephant's footprint, so all of the Buddha's teachings fit within the Four Noble Truths. And in my um, travels throughout the world and meeting Buddhists from other um, traditions, um, I would agree that the Four Noble Truths are the teaching that, that unifies all the different Buddhist traditions. So in that um, formulation of the Four Noble Truths, um, the Buddha said that dukkha, suffering, arises from craving. Now, um, first point to make is that Desire is divided into two categories. Um, so <clears throat> volition, um, aspiration, and um, motivation, all of these um, factors can be considered in the wholesome or unwholesome, skillful or unskillful um, side. So um, craving is the kind of desire that arises naturally 
um, immediately or um, spontaneously uh, whenever we lack a true understanding of the way things are. The um, wholesome kind of desire, in Pali is a different word for it, chanda or dhamma chanda or kusala chanda, um, is that kind of desire that arises from a correct um, understanding of, accurate understanding of the way things are. So, for instance, seeing the reality of human suffering and injustice, um, cruelty, and um, wanting to help to do something about it would be considered the wholesome kind of desire. It's a desire uh, founded in arising from um, a clear perception of the way things are. The, um, so when we talk about craving the cause of suffering, we could um, perhaps even imagine a bracket or a parenthesis with the, with the second Pali word, avicca, or ignorance, uh, to remind us that craving is ignorant desire. It is the craving resulting from ignorance. So the Buddha is saying that um, there is nothing or nobody, there's no situation that can make us suffer. Because although the, the triggers or the external conditions uh, would be a strong inducement to suffer or put it, would uh, make it highly likely that we would suffer, or very hard not to suffer, there has to be an element of craving in our own heart. There has to be a lack of awareness of the way things are for suffering to arise. So um, the implications of this are, um, are wide-ranging, profound, I think very um, exceedingly interesting to, to reflect upon. I mean, what it means is that uh, we, uh, we don't need to see ourselves as the, uh, the prey or the victim of any situation um, because uh, for suffering, mental suffering to arise, there has to be some kind of inner ascent or there is some inner condition which must combine with the outer condition for suffering to ensue. Now, um, at the time of the Buddha, there was uh, the word Buddhism hadn't yet appeared in the world, and the Buddha would most um, frequently refer to his teachings as the Dhamma Vinaya, so the Dhamma or Dhamma, I'm sure you will be reasonably familiar with. Vinaya, perhaps not so much. And the word Vinaya, um, that uh, most people are, the sense of it that most people are familiar with is uh, of the monastic discipline. You say the Prat Vinaya in, 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 in Thai, which refers to the monk's discipline. In fact, um, Vinaya has a much wider um, meaning than simply the monastic discipline. It refers to all of the ways in which we seek to create or to influence the external world in such a way as to provide optimum conditions for the practice of Dhamma. And so in, in setting up the monastic order, uh, the Buddha wasn't compelled to make compromises with the existing social conventions and uh, political systems in Northeast India. He was able to create an institution uh, which was defined by rules, conventions, which he 
uh, established himself. Uh, for this reason, the monastic order has always uh, considered the Buddhist community par excellence in that um, it was set up by the Buddha, its parameters, its conventions, its culture was all established from nothing by a fully enlightened Buddha. Whereas the Vinaya for lay Buddhists um, is not, uh, uh, cannot be as, um, as refined, as complex, as supportive, and has to make so many uh, compromises with non-Buddhist forces in the world. But nevertheless, um, the idea is, as far as possible, to create conditions within one's family, one's community, one's um, culture that um, support goodness and kindness and wisdom and compassion and um, do not support all of the conditions that um, pull down uh, or uh, undermine those qualities in our hearts and minds. So um, having said that, we begin with uh, right view, understanding um, expressed in the Four Noble Truths that our suffering can never be solely um, uh, the uh, result of the actions of others. At the same time, that is not a teaching of passivity that therefore Buddhists should um, seek to deal with their own minds and prevent suffering arising in their own minds um, and, that, and to take the oppressive or difficult conditions as given. On the contrary, um, we are taught to seek to um, amend the unsatisfactory external conditions as well. So this is an either-or teaching, a one is kind of throwing up our hands in despair at the iniquity of the world and let's just close our eyes and meditate and go off and live in a, um, a happier place, even if it's only for half an hour a day. Um, what we are learning in our Buddhist practice is um, wisdom and skillful means and compassion um, to um, develop both in terms of Dhamma and Vinaya. Um, to give a very simple example of this, um, many people complain of uh, mental agitation and <clears throat> um, neurotic worries and, and is a whole kind of thinking process out of control um, phenomena that's so common in the world today. And what is the kind of the magic bullet, the magic pill, the Buddhist technique um, that will uh, free me from this? And whereas there are effective um, Buddhist techniques of dealing with mental agitation, um, there is also the need for us to look at our life, our daily life, and see if we are creating the conditions uh, for mental agitation um, in areas in which we don't really need to do that. So if you have a, like a big mess um, on, the, on the floor, and you say, well, um, have you got a good cleaning agent, one which will effectively remove all these stains from the wood? Uh, and um, the answer would be, well, yes, I do. It's hard work, um, but it would make sense uh, to be a lot more careful about not letting um, the, the floor get so dirtied and stained in the first place. And so in looking at our minds, it's not like Buddhism or the latest kind of panaceas in the West, like secular mindfulness or whatever the, the latest um, fad of the day is, that this is um, going to make everything better by itself. Um, it leads a wide-ranging um, review of the way that we live our lives, including how we spend our time, how much time we spend on our computers, on our smartphones, 
um, watching um, TV and so on and so forth in order to create a way of life um, which is as far as possible in harmony with our spiritual goals and aspirations or at very least not in direct opposition to it. So the, um, the area of uh, anger then uh, that is considered a mental defilement and one which can only arise um, when we don't see things clearly. So I think it's common in many cultures, particularly Western, Western-influenced cultures these days, to discriminate between um, uh, destructive anger and constructive anger. There's the idea that if you're in a situation where, for instance, a long ongoing struggle, say a social struggle against injustice, that um, anger um, is needed to provide the sort of energy um, and endurance you need to stay in um, and keep going in this struggle for a long period, that um, greed provides energy and motivation. The, uh, the Buddhist critique um, of this view would be um, that anger um, only ever makes things worse, both for ourselves and others, and that anger um, is a coarse emotion, uh, one that feeds on um, mistaken thoughts and perceptions and in turn provokes further mistaken thoughts and perceptions and the angry mind is one which lacks subtlety, ability to de detect the nuances of a situation, one which has the wisdom to be able to look into the causes and conditions underlying um, phenomena and to apply oneself to remedying them um, as best one can. So the, the first step to um, eliminating anger is to want to eliminate anger or to see the value of it or to see it as um, one of one's main spiritual goals in life. So as long as we think, well, anger is actually good in such a case and maybe not always such a bad thing, uh, then uh, we will never really make uh, too much headway with it because the mind is such a, uh, a tricky and uh, dishonest um, organ in its untrained state that we can always find some excuses. So uh, we might say it's like a, a zero tolerance attitude um, to to anger. Say um, if we think it's um, legitimate or tolerable in such a situation, we're lying to ourselves, and we shouldn't um, believe our mind at that point. So, um, so if we do, um, we do see this and are interested in, in practicing in this way, then um, how do we deal with it, practically speaking? What are the steps to uh, finding freedom from um, anger and negativity in our life? Well, there are three, three main areas um, which uh, correspond to the three trainings, which are in itself that's through the idea of the dry sikara, the three training, is a, a summary of the eightfold path. But in the threefold uh, training, we need to train in the area of conduct, emotion, and understanding. And this is an organic and uh, we call holistic kind of training in which it's not step by step, but all three areas need to be addressed simultaneously. So... Um, in the area of conduct, then the tool that we employ is volition or willpower. So uh, willpower is, and volition is a somewhat limited tool, 
but it is the most effective tool um, for making immediate and radical changes uh, to the quality of our life. So um, in the case of anger, um, we cannot, uh, or it would be foolish, um, to uh, decide that, oh, now I'm a, I'm a Buddhist or now I'm a spiritual person, uh, I'm going to love everybody, I'm going to be full with forgiveness and, and um, try to uh, create a kind of a new spiritual persona for ourselves. Um, because it's just not possible to do that. We can't change or prevent the arising of emotion through an act of will. But what we can do is we can make changes to our conduct. Uh, we can uh, make a decision that um, even though I still get angry um, or offended uh, or irritable, um, I will not express those negative emotions um, physically or verbally. So this is not um, this is a crucial. I make a crucial distinction here. This is not saying anger is bad. If I'm a, if I feel angry, I'm a bad person. I'm not really a spiritual person. I'm a hip hop hypocrite. Um, nothing nothing like that. What we're saying is that it takes a long um, time. Uh, to uh, reduce and eliminate um, anger and negativity in the human mind. But uh, what we can do is, uh, right from day one, as it were, um, is to um, make a decision uh, not to impose these um, emotions on the people around us. In fact, the... Um, the keeping of, of precepts, and in particular this first precept, um, we can term as one of the most um, wonderful and beautiful gifts that you can give to family and community. Um, because all of us, I believe, um, need to feel safe. And if we don't feel safe in any way, um, it's painful and it's uh, very unlikely that we will realize any kind of inner peace or happiness. So that sense of safety and security is fundamental to any uh, quality of life. And that if we, are, um, if we make it clear that no matter how we feel, we will not abuse anybody physically or verbally, we are giving them the gift of safety. Um, giving them a, a, a wonderful gift. And if you live in a community where everyone freely gives that gift to everyone else, um, as in a monastic order, then you have foundations for um, very happy social life. Now, by um, refraining from acting upon negative emotions and thoughts and volitions, um, the effort or the intention to refrain uh, allows us to stop that habitual um, uh, tendency um, to act aggressively or to react aggressively to things we don't like or don't suit us. And so um, the case where um, the thought to um, speak or act aggressively arises, uh, we uh, wake up to it, we're aware of it as an aggressive impulse uh, because of our commitment uh, to the training of not acting aggressively or speaking aggressively. So we wake up, we see what's going on in our mind. Uh, mindfulness arises, in other words. And once we stop, um, we interrupt that habitual stream of consciousness, then there is an opportunity for making um, rational and wise, skillful decisions as, um, is this right, is this wrong, do I want to do this or do I not, what alternatives are there, um, what better alternatives are there. So that kind of um, 
skillful, wise decision-making is conditioned by the ability to stop and wake up in the midst of um, habitual, um, unwise streams of thought and condition. So this is the role that volition plays in this training. Every time we act upon an angry impulse, we strengthen the tendency to be angry in the future. This is the law of kamma. Every time we uh, let go of that volition to act, speak uh, with anger, that anger is, um, is deprived of nourishment. It, <clears throat> it withers. And so we can see over the course of time that there are this, um, the desire, the volition to act out of anger um, starts to atrophy because it's never acted upon. Just as a muscle never used becomes weak and atrophied. But this is, um, of course, not dealing uh, with the anger itself. And for more profound um, uh, practice, uh, we seek to cultivate, systematically cultivate the virtues which most directly oppose or undermine anger. And there are many um, such positive emotions, but I'll pick out three in particular. One, mindfulness. Secondly, patience or forbearance. And thirdly, is um, loving kindness. So loving kindness is most obviously uh, the direct opposite of, of anger. Wanting somebody to be happy, uh, wanting someone to be to suffer. These are you know, direct opposites. So the extent to which we can create this desire for all beings to be happy um, is creating um, a way of looking at the world, a way of being in the world, which is going to uh, reduce the likelihood um, that um, the negative emotions will arise in the first place. Similarly, before we get really angry um, or lose our temper, there are almost always um, indications that beforehand that we are starting to follow. We've entered upon the path towards anger and, and temper. And often um, these manifest as tension in the physical body. And uh, the area of tension will vary from person to person. It might be in the shoulders, in the arms, in the, in the tummy. It can be in different areas. But if you um, have uh, sufficient mindfulness to observe um, where the first physical manifestations of anger arise, that becomes your early warning system. And as you, re because often the, the thinking is not manifest in such a uh, way that you can um, have some really angry thoughts going on, but the phys physical um, manifestation comes first. And if we can catch it there, it's much easier to let go of. Uh, forbearance, men uh, patient endurance is um, absolutely essential. In, in fact, the Buddha singled it out as the supreme incinerator of defilements. So that's the ability to, um, in Tanjan Sumedho's um, excellent um, definition, the ability to peacefully coexist with the unpleasant. So when you have an um, um, angry impulse or just full of self-righteousness or, or whatever, and just to be there with it, and just to experience it fully, without trying to get rid of it, without indulging in it, just being with it peacefully, that, that is uh, kanti, patient endurance. It's not um, uh, just sort of gritting your teeth um, and, and preventing some kind of explosion, um, but the, the true uh, kanti is that being able to be at peace with something which we find oppressive or difficult or, un, um, or um, frightening even. So 
um, these are all areas in which we are developing positive emotions which most effectively deal with the negative emotion. But behind the negative emotion, uh, there are certain uh, ideas, certain ways of thinking, um, certain attachments, um, which um, will always uh, provide a resurgence or reappearance of the anger whenever we lose our mindfulness or become slack and lax in our practice. Um, so for a complete elimination of the anger and all the kinds of negativity, then we need to be uh, looking at this area using our wisdom uh, faculty, both in the, um, the, on the level of discursive um, investigative thought and in the, um, the peaceful um, mind which has gone beyond thinking, but the, uh, the mind which is both peaceful but very sharp and clear and able to examine phenomena in a non-discursive, non-verbal mode. So that first kind of wisdom we call yoni so manisikara, for those of you interested in the technical terms, and the second level would be in the area of vipassana. Um, so in our uh, investigation of, of anger, um, we can start off by um, simple uh, pros and cons investigation. Um, and for instance, we can reflect uh, upon the physical effects on our bodies of allowing ourselves to be angry or indulging in anger and the relationship or the correlation between anger and heart disease and even cancer. The fact that when we are angry, we release um, poisonous toxins into our bloodstream. So we literally poison ourselves every time we become angry. So this is a you know, preliminary um, investigation on the physical um, results of, of anger. We can also uh, reflect that um, just as um, one single match um, uh, once lit can destroy a forest of thousands and thousands of acres or square miles, um, similarly one moment of anger can consume all of the merit and the good karma that we have accumulated over many lifetimes. So to develop um, a sense of um, healthy fear of, um, of anger. There, <clears throat> just as a, a, um, a slight digression, I'm always looking for more... Um, satisfactory translations of Pali technical terms. And um, there are two important terms, hiriotapa, um, which uh, are difficult to translate because um, if we were to translate them directly as fear and shame, they're, they're not very inspiring kinds of things uh, to for us to aspire to mostly, I think. So I... Um, these, these um, technical terms do have specific meanings and uh, I have in the past been translating them as intelligent fear and intelligent shame um, and recently um, have decided on uh, adopting the term healthy. So uh, a healthy fear of consequences um, is the, my chosen uh, translation for the word otapa. So this kind of fear, uh, which just arises in a very healthy way when you see that a particular course of action is going to cause um, suffering for yourself and others. So it's not a neurotic fear, it's a healthy fear. And um, by reflecting on the law of karma and the terrible karmic consequences of acting with anger, um, 
then uh, this healthy fear can come up and creates um, um, a protection against um, those angry actions and behavior. So that um, helps to strengthen the first area of training in sila or precepts. The, the whole um, the area um, in which um, we focus a lot of attention is in looking to the degree to which anger is the function of frustrated craving. So when we want something very badly and we don't get it, how do we feel? They say may, uh, many people will feel angry. Um, other people might feel depressed. But that um, unwillingness um, to accept that we cannot get our own way um, is a major cause of this kind of anger and negativity, particularly if we've been brought up in such a way or lived in an environment in which we are used to getting our own way. Um, the more we take that for granted, um, then the more we will be offended when we can't um, get what we want. The, um, the sense of self um, is very much um, a factor here. When we have an idea of who we are or who we should be seen to be or how we want others to see us, um, then if, um, for instance, we feel oh, we're at a certain uh, kind of level, a certain kind of position, a certain status, and we expect to be act, um, we expect to be treated accordingly, um, respected accordingly, and we're not, be a major cause of anger. So this unwillingness to be with um, certain phenomena because it offends our idea of how we should be or how we should be treated. Um, this is a uh, you know, fertile ground for, um, for anger to arise. The, um, the perception of self and others, the way that we create these independent, self-existent entities, me and you, out of the raw stuff of experience um, is what um, lies behind this kind of anger at, a, at an even more profound level. There's a, a favorite story of mine of the man with the um, new boat, which he's very fond of, rows it into the middle of a lake, and suddenly there's a crashing sound. He looks behind, somebody's rowed his boat into this man's boat, and cause considerable damage. The man is, um, quite naturally, you might think, angry. How could you be so foolish? Big lake, two small boats. Um, uh, how could you be so foolish? And so on and so forth. So he goes back to his um, to the jetty, repairs the boat. It's as good as new. Sets out again, and who'd believe it? Um, but something crashes into his boat for a second time. Second time, same amount of damage. He looks around and there's nobody rowing the second boat. It's just floated away from its mooring. So um, if you can imagine yourself in that position and you're going to ask yourself, if you were angry the first time, would you be so angry, as angry the second time? Uh, given that the damage to the boat is the same in both cases. I think that most people would answer that they wouldn't be so angry the second time. Why not? Because uh, there was nobody who did it to me. So um, this is, this is um, a, a way of, of uh, illuminating this idea that we create, he did something to me, um, and how that is the painful thing. That is which, the thing that brings up the emotion. 
because in in the story, as as you remember, the damage to the boat is identical. Um, so it's not the damage which is the the question here. It's he did that to me. Who who does he think he is, or why is he like this way? And so we have this. Uh, we create this idea of fixed people um, and fixed me, fixed him, fixed her, and then we have all these ideas about how they should be. They should be like this. They shouldn't be like that. They should speak like this. They should be. They should understand why. Why did you do that? I told you before not to do that so many times. What did you not understand? Why don't you do? So this will why, why, why? Um, why are you the way you are? Why do you do the things you do? You shouldn't be the way you are. You shouldn't do the things you do. And this uh, way of thinking, which is, uh, comes naturally to us, but is in fact one of the major causes of our suffering, um, we can see has the most detrimental effects when we apply it to ourselves. Um, so a sense of um, uh, angry and unforgiving um, of ourselves for things, foolish things we've done in the past. Um, and um, I think that many people carry around this kind of self-loathing or self-hatred or aversion to self, um, partly because they think it's kind of virtuous to do that, in a sense it's taking responsibility uh, for their actions in the past, and that without it, it would be like they were um, not taking full responsibility. They got away, got away with it. Um, but in fact, when uh, when we think in this way, we're making a fundamental error. My analogy here is: if you have a house and all the windows and doors are left open then naturally anybody who wants to walk in can, whether it can be um, a good person or a bad person or a serial killer. Anybody can walk in if the doors are open, windows are open. Um, but if the person, persons who come into the house go on to do really nasty or foolish things, then we don't blame the house. We don't say it's a bad house. Um, but the cause and conditions for this to take place were that the door was left open. So the analogy here is that um, our minds, uh, when they lack uh, training cultivation, um, are like door, uh, houses with the doors left open, and negative mental states can come in. And if the um, positive mental states have not been systematically cultivated, negative mental states will... Um, overpower them, and then the uh, the consequences of that will will become obvious. So it's when we when we say because I did a bad thing, uh, therefore I am a bad person, that we make a fundamental error. Um, bad actions occurred because um, of all the causes and conditions that preceded them. Um, the extent to which we had developed um, wholesome, skillful mental qualities, the extent to which we had indulged in um, uh, unwholesome, unskillful mental states, both in this life and previous lives, um, led to that um, particular event. And if we understand it in this way, rather than viewing our life in terms of um, selves, acting and being acted upon, but coming to the uh, what we can experience in the present moment, which is mental states um, rising and passing away, we can see, well then, um, we can make amends for that um, by seeking to cultivate the wholesome mental states assiduously um, and to sincerely find skillful means to reduce and eliminate the neg negative mental states. So there's no room uh, for anger here. So we don't need to hold on to anger because it is always um, making things worse and clouding our vision of the way things are, coarsening the mind um, and preventing us from 
creating happiness, welfare for ourselves and happiness and welfare for others. So um, the more we, um, if we develop our meditation practice and we begin to uh, develop more uh, subtle and peaceful states of mind and to see how beautiful um, those states of mind are, then there will also um, be a natural comparison and coarse mental states um, become uh, experienced as coarse, not just an intellectual recognition of them as being coarse, but we feel a natural shying away from them. Um, and this is um, what we call a natural or healthy shame. So it's not a shame I'm bad, but it's just a sense of this is ugly and coarse and just moving away from it. So in that sense, the, the cultivation of positive emotion can also um, uh, feed into the wisdom practice in that it gives a, an emotional ballast or an emotional um, um, backup to the investigation. Um, when we practice uh, meditation and we begin to see um, clearly for ourselves mental states, um, positive, negative, neutral, arising and passing away according to causes and conditions, um, our idea of ourself changes, our idea of who we are changes. This isn't, um, this Buddhist practice is not just um, a way of uh, reducing uh, tension and uh, um, giving us some kind of pleasant abiding, but it is revolutionary, um, rejigging and, and re-education of our whole sense of ourself in the world because we're seeing every part of ourself that we have created and fitted into this narrative of me um, and my life um, as only having a very contingent and conventional reality. And it's here that the, the root of anger and other defilements is ultimately um, uprooted and destroyed. So this is uh, some, I uh, offer you some thoughts and reflections on this one uh, large area of um, Buddhist practice and cultivation um, dealing with um, negativity, anger, um, and all of its various um, manifestations through the practice of the threefold training. So I'd like to uh, offer this to you for your reflection. So we have some time for discussion, questions and answers. It doesn't have to be about the talk, it can be about anything at all. I'd like to talk about it. started off on creeds, hatred and delusion, but we didn't get much past greed. Hatred. Hatred. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, it would take all day. Yes, yeah, so I just chose <laughs> just one, one area. Yeah. Did but you you, Abhicha, because you mentioned Abhicha. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's a technical uh, distinction, isn't it? Um, Avicca, you can't be, um, you can't develop um, a practice of awareness of of, of Avicca. It's like the fundamental condition of not seeing the way things are. Moha is more um, particular manifestations of of. Um, this lack of understanding or um, so for instance like um, mental confusion uh, would be an aspect of moha but not let's say it would be avijja so the, these um, these are all all connected of course and I was saying I uh, did make the point that um, uh, Anger or all of those uh, negative emotions are uh, bound up with um, the uh, craving and desire in that when you 
um, are frustrated in your desire for things, then you feel anger or um, you feel offended and uh, it's not right or you should have. You, sometimes you feel you have a right to get the things that you want and uh, feel angry when you can't get them. Well, both uh, that uh, desire and that anger are underpinned by this delusion um, that you are somebody who will gain something. Um, you will become something more, something more complete um, by um, gaining um, a form, a sound, a feeling, an idea, an experience. So this idea that I am basically lacking something which can be provided by something outside of myself. So there are, there are uh, these three things are, are always um, related to each other. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, so freedom from anger as being something that arises naturally or as arises through a series of practices. Um, what, what, I, what I was um, trying to point out was that we have to begin with... Um, our actions and speech, um, because as long as we are acting upon angry impulses, expressing them, we're feeding them. And so um, we never um, are able to develop the power of wisdom um, as long as we're feeding that anger at the same time. It's like one step forward and two steps backwards. Or if indeed, if we're, if we're expressing anger a lot, um, often we won't even want to meditate or we won't even want to use um, the wisdom, even if you know um, how to do it. Um, because it's, um, it, just, it just makes you feel worse. Um, and it, it's, if somebody's um, constantly acting upon their anger, then almost inevitably they'll build up a whole series of um, justifications for it to make it feel okay because we need to feel um, some sense of self-respect. So when we act in ways which undermine our self-respect, we create a new story to make it all right. Everybody does it. It's normal. I'm under a lot of pressure. I'm this and I'm that. So uh, apart from creating the kind of safe environment um, in which you can conduct this more um, uh, subtle investigation, you have to create external environment which is supportive first and not acting upon anger and living in a place where you don't feel that you're going to be treated angrily is, is a condition for that. Um, yes, the, the investigation, the wisdom, understanding of anger um, is ultimately what produces freedom from anger, but how does that wisdom how does that understanding arise? What are the causes and conditions for it to arise? So it's not, I mean, we, we can say we know the answer, seeing the arising and passing away of anger as being impermanent, not self, and, um, and, and suffering is ultimately um, the way that anger disappears. But how do you get there? It's like you say, we know what the view is from the top of the ladder, but how do you get up there? Um, and so precepts and developing mindfulness and patience and loving kindness. All these things are providing the foundation uh, bef uh, on which that kind of wisdom uh, can uh, really um, be most effective. So if you, if you apply wisdom and understanding in an intellectual level, but without that 
uh, emotional maturity that comes through meditation practice, it won't really penetrate the sense of self, which is what undermine, underlies anger ultimately. To be able to see through the way that we create this sense of self moment by moment, then that's an organic practice which um, um, requires practice both in, on the level of conduct and emotion and thinking and so many different things all harmonized together. Does that answer your question or not really? Let's see. Go ahead. Let's start. No, please, carry on. Did you want to say something more? Yeah. So, uh, first you do it as a bullying, but then you use a sleep patient before it's really mature and natural. No, um, it, it's, all, it's all involved. It's all uh, keeping precepts um, gives rise to wisdom. Because, it, for instance, you have a volition not to... Um, not to shout at someone when you're angry, okay? So that's uh, merely on the level of willpower. No matter how angry I am, I'm not going to shout at that person. But you, you used to shout at them. So you have the momentum, you have that habit. So somebody does something really foolish or dangerous, and you're about to shout at them, and then you realize, oh, yeah, or you remember, I've made a determination not to shout at people. And so what do you do? You, you feel the tension in your body. You know, everything's, you know, kind of forcing it out of your mouth, but you're patient with that. You're just, you're not repressing it or you're just being with it and just realize, realizing physically how it feels and then it passes away. And that's wisdom. You can see that that intention uh, to shout uh, arises and passes away. You don't have to act upon it. Um, and once you have pass through that, your mind's very calm. And then you can make some very good choices about what's the best way to deal with this situation. You know, if I don't shout, well, should I say something right now or wait for another time? Is something that needs to be done immediately? So your mind is, has all kinds of choices. Um, the angry mind doesn't have choices. Um, so you you there that's a wisdom practice you're you're learning something about expression of anger dealing with emotions um what what um what are the conditions for intelligent uh response to situations all beginning with this practice of not expressing anger um uh physically or verbally uh similarly the um Development of mindfulness, as I said, where you're becoming sensitive to the physical cues that precede anger and being able to deal with them there and then. Uh, the extent to which um, the cultivation of thoughts of loving kindness inhibit the arising of thoughts of anger. They st you develop a new habit, a habit of kindness rather than a habit of, of anger. You begin to see um, through your investigations after you've been angry or something, you go back and you have a look at it. What was really going on there? Um, oh, yeah, I really wanted him to do something, um, and he did something else. Um, and so there's fr my frustrated desire, not, not because he was this and he was that, but because of the expectations and the desires that I brought to the situation. So these are all the vari various aspects of the way that we're dealing in a very kind of organic way, wherever in certain circumstances then the, the um, precepts come to play a, a major role. Other aspects, it's the medita meditative side. And then leading finally to this uh, vipassana, which is a very high level, and it's only an enlightened being that reaches that level, where the sense of self and others and the attachment to mental phenomena as being self is finally abandoned. But that's a long, you know, that's a long way in the future, that kind of um, intuitive understanding. And so we need to be working on all the different levels at the same time. So it's hard work. It's not, no, it's not something that will just arise naturally. Um, well, it, I mean, unless we, it'll arise naturally when we put a lot of work over a lot of years into creating the conditions for it to happen naturally. Yeah. So this is like the old um, you know, argument between slow and 
gradual and sudden enlightenment. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a sudden enlightenment after many years of gradual enlightenment, you know, so... Uh, in case somebody else, yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I, I would say another point I didn't make in the talk is, you know, why, why I mean, people are, get angry and, and, and lose their tempers a lot, you know. Well, one reason is they want to. I mean, there's always a part of us that actually enjoys being angry. Um, and uh, if you're particularly you're in, a, in a situation in which you feel disempowered, you know, um, traditionally women or, or anybody in a, um, and where nobody listens to you, now, when's the one time when somebody will actually pay you attention? You know, when you shout at them, when you're angry. And, and that feeling of suddenly power that arises, you know, and everybody's looking at you and everybody's interested. And that, that's, the, that's the hook. Yeah, that's the hook. That's how people get caught in anger. It, it's a kind of intoxication. So that's one part of it. But in, in a meditative sense, then we can be aware of it as as vibrations, as energy. And if we can take away the, the story from it, separate the story from the energy, um, and then just be aware of it physically, then we can just feel it um, just naturally. Uh, we can actually, uh, you can create uh, the perception of it just draining away into the ground in a very natural way or create some kind of mental image of it dissipating in a, in a natural way. So we, we, there are a lot of practices in which we can use our imaginative powers and create to, to create stories and images that, that can deal with um, physical energy. Or in, in case of dealing with a lot of um, thinking, you know, one of uh, a nice technique is if you catch yourself, you know, when this kind of going on, and just imagine that the words, if, if these are predominantly a verbal um, stream, if you can imagine those words as being written in water. Um, and, and then you don't have to do anything, but just so it just happens naturally. You, something in your brain just sort of dissolves those words in the water without you feeling it's something that I'm doing. Um, and that's a very natural and, and, and um, uh, enjoyable way of just dissolving thought. It's not like I'm trying to do something to stop myself thinking, but when it's uh, visualized as... It's, it's, uh, words in water, it happens by itself. So there are many, many ways that you can, you know, that sometimes we think like thinking is kind of the enemy in meditation, but, but well-disciplined thinking can, can actually um, strengthen meditation in, in many areas, and whether it be creating stories and creating patterns and, and images uh, which reflect um, the kind of um, thing that you want to do, whether it's a healthy um, natural kind of way of dissipating negative energy or, or to dealing with um, thought, as I, I would just mention. I have a question about delusion and compassion. Mm. Sometimes, if I'm compassionate, sometimes it's just me projecting an opinion when they're not practicing well enough. Sometimes it's me projecting an opinion of them not being good enough, mm. and that would arise compassion. And this is, for me, this is not correct. Yeah. And uh, mm. that balance, and, and I'm starting to think that opinions are just, there's this mold that opinions are nonsense, but that's just the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I don't think you have to separate. I mean, the compassion is um, the response to human suffering. Um, 
but that idea of whether people are at the level they should be or shouldn't be or they're doing that that's that's something separate uh, from from compassion two different things so should compassion only be for somebody that is in physical pain or asking for that? not physical pain mental pain um but we're all no no i mean it's just um you know as you, as you as your mind becomes clearer then the the brahma viharas just start uh, arising very naturally um and it's you know it's a good measure of of uh the maturity of your practice that um when you uh, when you see, when you see people who are suffering in any way then uh you just feel that you want to to help them to be free of suffering so that you know, this idea of the um theravada as being sort of very self centered and so i don't see that i mean just see that um the reduction and elimination of suffering wherever it appears just becomes a, a natural preoccupation of the mind as you as you practice more you know whether whether it's her suffering his suffering my suffering it doesn't that's that doesn't really um play a major part in it so much anymore um but yeah views and opinions i mean i'm you know as you you know my age now it's like i i was i was trying to i like to come up with similes and and analogies and it's like now if you can imagine your views and opinions like a ball in your hand so so now like at my age i mean my 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 views and opinions feel like a tennis ball in my hand you know it's just like this but to because of my age and standing in the sangha for many people now it's like a cricket ball or like it's really heavy ball so i you know so i have to be careful because sometimes i i express an opinion and for me it's yeah it's just it's just that much you know but for for many people it's like gospel truth you know and it's like you know it's like wow you know, that's that's your opinion you know but um yeah i mean it's just uh, i've been wrong so you know i i i think surely as you get older you know you just have a whole huge database surely of all the times you've been wrong i do anyway and uh i i try not to forget all those all those times um and if you're somebody who's overly self confident uh you should definitely um try to cultivate or to keep such a file in your mind and if you're someone who's uh just the opposite lacks self confidence you should have open a file of all the times you've been right um and refer to that at regular intervals there yeah. Yeah but just to see we're always going to have opinions I mean our culture our background and so on and it's all right but uh, it's just it's more yeah this is an opinion but if you find that you often you find yourself in a meeting um and there's uh, some kind of uh, discussion and then somebody and you find yourself defending an opinion that you don't have anymore you know <laughs> because it's bound up with a sense of who i am and how i'm seen by the other people and having to maintain a certain kind of um uh, level you know or image yeah, and that's when uh, uh opinions become you know a burden and can become difficult sorry was there somebody so shouldn't not write books shouldn't write books yeah <laughs> having then to defend this opinion that you have written down <laughs> No I I I I read something I really like somebody uh, was um accosted and he said well what you're saying now is very different from what you wrote in a book 10 years ago <laughs> um or something and he says um yes well when i get new information i change my mind what do you do <laughs> I think that's a really good answer yeah <laughs> Yeah um yes yeah, so someone's asking um in the the brahma vihara so kind of like the four um uh elevated or, or um what what they called as uh, the the four divine, divine, divine abiding so I'm thinking Thai, yeah. um there there is uh, loving kindness or metta karuna compassion mudita sympathetic joy and upekara is equanimity so the question is can there be too too much compassion and then it becomes uh the mind is um 
overly swayed by um, uh, pity for it. So I think Ki Song San is more like English pity rather than Song San meaning compassion. Um, so I, it's one of those few cases where, where English has a kind of a notable distinction um, in this area. Um, the reason why the Buddha uh, taught so often in terms of groups of dhammas, groups of virtues, groups, is because he, he understood the relationship between them. These are not just arbitrary groups. Um, and when we take things out of context in, in Buddhist teaching, that's when we start to um, get confused or to misunderstand. So those four have to be taken together. And in, we can also say that in every group, almost every group, there will always be a representative or a word meaning wisdom in or one aspect of wisdom. And in the four Brahma Viharas, then Ubekar is the wisdom factor. So, um, and so equanimity is uh, not the same as indifference or neutral feeling. It's the evenness of mind which comes through profound reflection on the law of kamma. That we all, at the end of the day, we all have to, we are all the owners of our kamma, heirs to our kamma, um, and so on. So this is always in our back of our mind. You really, you see someone, you really want to help them to be happy. Um, but you know there are no guarantees. Um, maybe you can, maybe you can't. Um, you want to, you see people are suffering. You're going to do everything you can to help them. But whether or not you'll be successful depends on all kinds of factors outside of your control. Um, not least of which is, is their kamma, which they've created in the past. So it's a kind of a neutral gear. So, Metta, uh, Karuna, Mudita, they're more kind of sort of positive things you're going out. But then, Upekas, uh, you're just coming back in and conserving energy when you can't, right now, you can't do anything. So perhaps, um, you know, some people have, you know, really want to help somebody. And then someone who's really caught up in drugs or, or something, and you, you really do everything to help them, and then they just reject you or, or betray you, you know. And then many people just feel, oh, that's it, you know, and write them off, or I did what I could, or just feel, really, I'm hopeless. I thought I could help them, and I couldn't. But with Upe Kars, you say, you do everything, okay, uh, th it's just not, nothing's happening now, it's just not working. So you withdraw and you take care of your own mind. And even though, well, this is just, you know, the causes and conditions are like this right now. But there's also within that a readiness um, to move back into more active mode of helping and do it when, when things change or when things uh, uh, would be most effective. So, so Upekar is, is uh, really inseparable. It's the wisdom faculty that oversees the other three Brahmaviharas. Yeah, I, I, I think that it's, um, it's a wise observation that, that um, well, let, let me um, go back to the Four Noble Truths again. You know, the first Noble Truth is there is suffering. It, it's not, I am suffering. Uh, I am suffering is, is not an insight into the Four Noble Truths. Everybody knows I'm suffering. But it, it's the I, which is the suffering. Okay, so... Um, when we think, uh, I am nervous, I am nervous, you know, the suffering is in the sense, there's me, the person who is nervous. 
But when you're just mindful of that sensation, it, it, it dissolves, but then it comes back again. So it's, you know, the question is, how do we go beyond that whole, what we, Buddha calls I making and me making, you know, because we make I, we make me moment by moment. But with the establishment of mindfulness, it's like we step back from that just for a moment and see at least a glimpse of what it would be like for freedom from that I making and me making process. So it's not like, uh, not so much, I don't think it's like present, past and future, although I, I can see how, how, how you would explain it that way. But it's more that when you were aware, then you weren't making that sense of me. Uh, and that was the freedom from sense of me, just for a moment. Um, Didn't see you there. Self aversion is um, a particularly toxic form of self indulgence. It's the flip side of narcissism. Um, okay, that's the. <laughs> um, pretty harsh view. Um, yeah, it's based on this idea of me, this person uh, who is a certain way, who has certain qualities. Um, and um, what I'm trying to explain is from from Buddhist point of view, that's something we construct. We, we construct this idea of ourself as being a certain way. But if we come to look very closely at our mind and our body in the present moment, which is all we've really got, uh, then it, it kind of dissolves. Where is it? We can't find it. Um, and so when we, um, we create an idea of something and that becomes the filter through which we experience the world. So it, with any kind of bias, cognitive bias, it's the same. You know, if you like something, then you tend to pick up on all the information um, that uh, is, is positive and, and you censor out the negative. So if you have your idea of yourself as being a particular way, like a negative way, then you're biased to um, pick up on and make something out of all the experiences and things which uh, correspond to that and, all, and to uh, explain away all of the experiences which um, oppose that view of yourself. So Buddhist idea is, is really to say, um, try to open up and to give equal weight to, to your experience and to see whether that negative idea about yourself really stands up to that. Uh, so it's not saying you shouldn't do that, but saying, um, are you really sure that that's an accurate uh, description of yourself or how, you know, for, for, for its other people? So I think that, um, in a way, um, or, or um, for some people, um, just as in Thailand, you know, there are a lot of people who are very lack of real intellectual understanding of Buddhist teachings, but have been influenced by them, like they're in their blood. This is, for instance, a sense of generosity that permeates this culture. Um, is a, like, for me, is an influence of, of Buddhist teachings over the years and many other sense of tolerance, um, of, of diversity, these kinds of things that people have just naturally without being able to explain or to give a Buddhist teaching to support them. One of the things in uh, growing up in the West, even in what in many cases is a secular culture in England or a even post-Christian culture, as some people call it, is uh, that um, influence of idea of original sin still very strong, even with people who don't go to church or don't feel any. Um, and this basic idea is fundamentally, you know, the inner most private part of me is, is bad, you know. And so you can see this. If you do, uh, often people do some really good thing and they've got this really kind and, and pure intention um, and so many wholesome, good, kind thoughts in the course of this. And then just suddenly, just a, like a, um, a rather ignoble thought arises, or oh, everybody's going to praise me for this, or I'm going to get this or get that. And then you pounce on that and you say, yeah, that's why I'm really doing it. And, and 
and the conceit of the cynic is like a cynical point of view is more realistic you know i'm being honest about how i really this is so the more negative you are the more realistic you are this is some of the kind of you know underlying conceits we have in the west i think and and this idea that a uh, like one uh, nasty ignoble thought is more real than a hundred uh, kind and positive thoughts so if you um if you just give equal weight to them then i think that uh, without sort of say just be positive and don't be so hard on yourself but just say be look really closely what's going on in your mind is it is it really um appropriate to have that yeah, kind of negative or is it just a bias that we've created and we've been feeding for a long time because that's how certainly how i see it um, Yes, yeah, so for those of you who can't hear, um, the lady was um, saying that um, she feels that uh, the answers lie within and we just, by just keep questioning and looking over and over again, uh, you find answers for yourself. It seems there's always an answer waiting if you're persistent enough and keep up, keep up, uh, keep looking and inquiring. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Um, I, I would, um, I would agree. Um, I would first of all say that um, we're, I think, in uh, generally speaking, we we're a bit too much obsessed with answers and not enough with questions. We don't ask good enough questions of ourselves, or we ask pointless questions or trivial questions, and we spend a lot of our life um, pursuing answers to trivial questions. Um, so uh, a little bit more attention on the quality of questions we ask ourselves, I think, is, is very uh, worth considering. Um, and obviously, you're, answering, you're asking important questions about your life. And I think that the more uh, mindful you are, the more clear your mind is, um, then the more you're in touch with how you really feel about things. So there's more communication with yourself. But ha having said that, um, you know, it is also easy um, to become, uh, to develop mistaken ideas or to have mistaken views or to have wrong answers. We can find the answer within us, but whether or not it's the right answer might not always be the case. Um, and this is why we, we need to uh, be studying the words of the Buddha and the great masters to just as a check. Uh, maybe we come to an answer and then we need to check it with what the Buddha said. And if it's uh, conflicting, then we need to maybe go back and have a look again and, and to see whether we're so sure in our answers. But I think that that's a very good practice and that inner inquiry um, is something which we can find very much in the lives of great masters. Ajahn Chah, my teacher, Never talking about his life often in forming like internal dialogue, asking himself questions. What is this? Why is it like this? So I think this is a sign of uh, how we develop wisdom by developing this inner inquiry. It's very, very good. But we do need some study and some reference to teachings of the fully enlightened beings to make sure we don't get off course. Yeah. One more question. Yeah, three o'clock. The one last question. I wanted to ask him about the military's government reform of Buddhism. So, if anyone wants to, if anyone wants to stop me answering that question, now is the time. 
So what is it? I don't know. <laughs> My point of view is whatever it is, I'll probably ignore it. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else or everybody good? Okay, Mandy, you've got the last one. Mm. And if so, like, I mean, how can we sort of check ourselves or, I mean, have awareness about that and not going too far in the thinking and the question? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's like overeating, isn't it? How do you know when you've, you're eating too much? I mean, you know, it's a feeling, um, you know, when you start to go around in circles. Um, I think that in many, many cases, it, it's good to have an arbitrary time limit for some really kind of knotty problem. And, uh, you know, give yourself a sufficient time. Okay, I'm going to give this a few days and I'm just going to really go into it, all the pros and cons and listen to wise people and, and then just leave it uh, for a while and just calm down. You just allow it to inwardly digest. Um, and then after a few days after that, make my decision. Um, but I, I think we, because, um, you know, certain topics are just endless, that all the ramifications and so many factors which you, you can't be sure about, um, that having some kind of a time limit on it is probably, a, you know, just a skillful means um, to, to use um, to, to make sure it's just not you know, going to... Yeah. 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 And then, as you jump in the bath, you say "Eureka!" And it's that kind of thing. So that's the idea. Um, I, I think it's also, you know, um, the thing about doubt as a hindrance um, is that the reason why doubt is such a tricky one. Um, is that when you're doubting something, um, you feel like you're being intelligent. You know, doubt, this, the voice of doubt is very similar to the voice of intelligent analysis. Um, so recognizing doubt as doubt, and as skeptic, you know, doubt in the sense of going round and round and round, um, is, is very important and seeing it as, as another mental state, but also to contemplate, um, the the fear we have of not getting it right or the desire we have to be absolutely sure before we make a decision that it's the right one and just to remind us that any decision it's always a, it's always a gamble even the most you know you spend a week or a month thinking saying something through at the end of the day it's just it's going to be a gamble so that that awareness or recognition of uncertainty and that the world is uh, out of your control, um, except for one very small segment of it, um, that that I think helps to reduce the overthinking of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who's in charge? Uh, nobody. Yeah.